In the whole history of crime, one issue is at the heart of the problem. How do you stop the young offender re-offending? Over the years, successive governments have often opted for punishment and the short, sharp shock. Dirt on your jacket, get it brushed off. 22 years ago, an experiment in the treatment of young offenders was filmed by the BBC's social affairs series, Man Alive. It was carried out at Pepper Harrow, an ex-approved school in Surrey. Pepper Harrow took boys rejected by other institutions. Before they were accepted, the boys had to make a positive commitment to the ideals of Pepper Harrow. When the BBC filmed in 1973, they featured six boys whom they selected at random. 22 years ago, no one could know how they would respond to the experiment. But in those days, in the approved school system, three out of four young offenders re-offended within two years. Time Watch has tried to trace those six boys and see what happened to them. They were Steve from Portsmouth, Philip from Manchester, Sid from London, Pete from Southampton, Martin from the Lake District, and Tony from Canterbury. How are you doing? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Tony, who was in the old film, is meeting Ian, whom he hasn't seen since they were at Pepper Harrow 20 years ago. Uh, it was a bit sad, really. Just another part of history gone. Well, I just sit out on this bank of sand and I watch the river flow. Never had to knock the door before to get in. Hello. Hello. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Pepper Harrow stands empty now. But back in 1973, it was a thriving community. There were 45 boys and 20 staff, and everyone had to do everything, all the cooking and all the cleaning. It was run by the director, Melvin Rose. But the results of this situation we don't know. And it can be someone's life. The basic aim was to get the boys to understand why they offended and so give them a better chance not to make the same mistakes again. In 1973, Steve had already been at Pepper Harrow for two years. Breaking and entering, things like that. It started from when I was about 10, I suppose. I never went to school and I got supervision sort of thing. And then I got probation, probation. And I got uh, built up to a pro school. I got sort of indefinite period. And I didn't, I thought, well, I'm going to a pro school, you know, but. I came to her eventually, so I was quite lucky, really. I went from a place called Kingswood in Bristol, which was a holding centre for young offenders at the time. And it was just all being locked up all day. Not all day, but being locked up and uh, just being told what to do. You, Everything was written out for you during the day. You go and do this, you go and do that. and. From there, we went uh, to Pepper Harrow, and I thought, well, what's going on here? An unbelievable thing. I mean, you walk in, and there's people just walking around doing as they please, and you think, this is the place for me. So, I mean, the first thing I was trying to do was get them to accept me to Pepper Harrow, for starters. I mean, I didn't care. I didn't want to go to one where they was going to bang me up all the time or anything like that, so I did my best to get accepted, and eventually did, and we went on from there. Something's changed that I don't know. Well, that was the old kitchens through there, mm. wasn't it? Mm. And then used to wheel out the breakfast. That was it. And yeah. The meals out to here. Yeah. I remember Don Shadrack bringing out beans on uh, Weetabix because <laughs> there's no bread. <laughs> Do you remember? No, I don't yeah, know. We'd all fight over it. <laughs> and this was the window. Old Steve Johnson used to sit here with the racing paper. That was it. Yeah. He's sitting there, you know, just totally into it. <laughs> Have a coffee, Steve. <laughs> trying to pick a winner here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. This was another real gathering place, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. God, think of the meetings that used to take place in here. Yeah. And it was a double circle, which was strange. Remember when the Yes, that's right. And yeah. An outer circle. Yeah. Each morning started with the community meeting. It lasted an hour. Attendance was compulsory. 
These meetings were the focal point of community life, full of tension and anticipation. I reckon I could plot out actually where the where the circle used to come to. I think they used to come to about come round like in a circular fashion. Yeah. <laughs> and like this. And did you where did you used to choose to sit though? Front or back? <coughs> in the back. You can hide yourself. Yeah, I used to sit you? over in that corner in the back. Yeah. In this meeting, pressure was being put on Pete to explain his violent behaviour. There's nothing wrong with you having the feelings that you have. You have them. That's reality. But there's quite a bit wrong with some of the negative ones that you have, with you wanting to hang on to them. You agree, really, don't you? Mm -hmm. Is there any way we can help you to talk about this? No. There's several of us who know, in fact, that your weekend didn't go as you wanted it to. <clears throat> You all sort something out, but you sort it out. Don't leave me alone. Can't we sort back, John? What? No, I'm talking to John. Do you know what it's all about? This? Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like I'm being used for a scapegoat and Pete's not even willing to talk about it. And I'm really getting pissed off. Stop it, stop it, stop it. Let go of me, man. Calm yourself down, oh, Pete. Just calm yourself down. Sit down. I don't want to be here. Well, I don't care whether you want to. You sit down and sort oh, no. that out first. No. Well, I'm sorry. That's the only way. Now sit down. Well, the community meeting had to put pressure on people to examine what they couldn't bear to examine. That's one of its tasks. Another one of its tasks was to manage the social environment so that it was absolutely clearly understood that certain forms of behavior were not acceptable, that it was not all right to steal, it was not all right to hit other people, it was not all right to um, bring the community's existence into jeopardy by the kinds of things that you did around you. And above all, it was not all right for you to injure yourself with behavior that made you function at your worst rather than at your best. So actually, it was a very tough situation. Well, that's why I have to say something, because we have to get it sorted out, because you won't stop hurting people otherwise, will you? I thought his mother intends to injure people. Well, no, been ill for the last two weeks. You know, my mom keeps <coughs> Finally, Pete admits that the real problem oh, lies yeah. elsewhere, at home with his family. It's my granddad's birthday. <coughs> Come on, I think you can sort this morning's situation out, because that's a damn sight easier than the one at home, isn't it? Well, do you think you can make some effort after this to get this morning sorted out? <coughs> so we've got to finish. Each meeting doesn't work. But the um, totality of meetings over a period of time does work. Towards the end of the week, things will begin to resolve themselves. And usually for a really profound um, change that moves everybody in there and that people remember for years and years afterwards to occur, probably needs several weeks of community meeting where gradually some central real issue that's festered within somebody for many years becomes exposed. It's not easy, really. It's quite difficult because of the actual, you know, things you have to understand to sort of uh, be a... The actual choice you make to be here is your choice, so you realise that you've got to uh, make a go of it, you know? Try to understand. 
What does it mean, making a go of things at Pepper Harrow? Because it's not the same as making a go of things in other kinds of institutions. Well, no, um, I think if you went to a Peru school, you do what they tell you, you know. That's it, you're stuck in a regimented place. But um, when you come here, you're uh, doing something for yourself, sort of thing. You're actually trying to make a go out of your own life, you know, whereas you haven't been able to before. Now, if you realise that your case isn't sort of uh, isolated, you know, your actual problems and things, then I think that helps you quite a lot. And so, therefore, you can, uh, you know, s resolve things which you, you never thought you had, you know. You know, if you nicked, you nicked, you know. There was nothing behind it. You, you just nicked, so that was it. One goes rather cold when listening to it. It's a strange experience from... 20 years ago, I suppose, it uh, makes one think again. You put it that way. Oh, dear. Oh, God. More plush carpets. Good. They've taken the bloody oh. radiator away. <laughs> oh, no. Can't do it now, can we? That, that oh, didn't used to Jesus. be. Jesus. There used to be one of these. Smaller uh, one there. Just here. It was only about this wide. Yeah. And everyone... Just used to be bum height, you know, yeah, you, could, yeah, just, you could just get just on there. Get on there. <laughs> it's not there, is yeah, it? No. And sit here and just watch what would happen. You could see everybody running around the landings, up and down the, the stairs. stairs. You could yeah. see everything from here. It was Philip's first week at Pepper Harrow. As well as community meetings, he had to attend small group meetings. The psychiatrist, Dr Nora Murrow, encouraged him to talk about his mother, who'd abandoned the family early on. He's got three other people to think about. The three other children. He was a little imp when we, you first saw him. But actually, uh, when we examined the referral papers that we were sent, our hearts sank. Not just because of his behaviour, but because we looked at what had happened to him since he was born. And we actually felt that even though he was only just 14, it was too late to be of any help to him. Why isn't it important about how you feel? It is important, but it's more important for the children, the other ones, to get a chance to get on, because they haven't been in trouble and they've got to learn not to get in trouble. He was quite concerned for the younger siblings, and it was... Uh, quite unusual and very encouraging, I thought, that Philip had got that dimension already from the beginning, which obviously, if he was able to make use of the experience, would uh, enable him to lead a very fulfilling life later on. So I felt that he made a very good start. Behaviour was destructive in many ways, like he would leave razor blades in the bar of soap that was in the common washrooms and so forth. Um, at the same time, there was an element of sensitivity and caring about him, which has remained consistent with him ever since. Well, she did really well with me, but mostly it matters about the younger ones, really, I think. Because I'm old enough to know about that. The parental relationship was pretty poor. Mother was often absent. Um, and I... <coughs> ended up carrying much of quite a lot of family responsibility at the time, getting the children up for school, um, not going myself, working um, pretty much full time at a very early age to, to make money, to, to sustain the family because my father was unemployed, um, he gambled, um, so I did what I felt I could do at that time. Unfortunately, that led me into more trouble with the authorities, really, <laughs> but um, that's how it was. Pardon? I think the official line was out of parental control, um, and the remand centre was the only place which actually could educate me, or that, so they felt. Um, so I think my first visit there was at 11 years old. Um, it was a similar thing, just getting expelled from schools, getting, um, <coughs> excuse me, getting um, thrown out of various children's homes and, and so on, and each time ending back up at the same same remand centre. Um, I think the next step would have been probably Borsal or something. But... Buckers! On! Hey! Historically, 
the story is about punishment and society has wanted to protect itself from the deviants. So you had leper colonies and you had the mad in their madhouse and you had the bad people in prison and that left uh, the good people to get on with their lives. There weren't very many uh, early attempts to deal with um, young offenders in any other way than that. Buddy. Buddy. I do think that there is some sort of deterrence in punishment, but it's really pretty minimal. At the beginning of my career, I suppose, I worked in approved schools for something like nine, ten years before Pepper Harrow. And so um, I had plenty of opportunity to experience uh, what it's like to be a member of staff in those circumstances and uh, to come to a conclusion that maybe one could do something more effective. One, two, three, four. It was the system of the short, sharp shock, which incidentally government ministers at that time were announcing as the new way which they were going to deal with delinquents. And this was the basis under which detention centres were set up. The building when you come down the drive is, is a fantastic building. But I think my first impression was the welcoming from the kids, which was striking, given that sort of prior to going there I'd been to two other places that I'd, that I'd found sort of completely different. And um, I think sort of very frightened about sort of what, what was going to happen to me over the next, the next six years, I suppose. I can clearly remember what it felt like prior to going to Pap Harrow, coming from sort of a very poor part of London. Um, and sort of, you know, being the youngest of six without a father, you know, and, and, and being destitute, really. There were times when we, we, we couldn't afford to eat. Therefore, you know, one set about putting that right in whatever way one could. And, um, you know, I can, I can sort of remember being in situations where I, I was very clear that I didn't want to be a part of that situation. But it was a question of whether we were going to get through to the next Monday in terms of, um, in terms of eating. You know, I was very worried. I was, um, I was illiterate. I was 15, illiterate. And I think probably somewhere inside, my, my fear was that actually I was going to end up in prison, um, given that sort of, um, the sort of job prospects didn't look so good. And, um, you know, one was sort of wondering sort of where, where sort of the next bit was going to come from. And I think sort of arriving at Pepper Harrow, you know, offered me a chance to sort of really put my feet up and, and take a, a big sigh of relief. just being allowed to develop, being able to play, which is which was something I many of us had to learn to do. You know, I mean it was playing didn't come naturally to many of us. Um, certainly innocent play rather than actually delinquent play. I mean there was play when we were you know down the old air raid shelters down the bottom of the field you'd have gangs that was throwing bamboo spears at each other which was delinquent play. But actually getting into doing things like swinging on a rope across the river was was nice. Right, this, this was it. it. Oh, yeah, look at it. Yeah, bloody hell. God almighty.
Uh, this is definitely the right place because I remember this. Yeah, I remember this. And so there was a bar situated about here. That was it. And there was one about here. That was and it. And you know what used to happen? Yeah. You'd be in the bath, having a lovely bath. Yeah. And somebody would come in and let, let the fire hose yeah, go. Yeah, so there was a fire hose on that wall there, wasn't it? Blast you across the room. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible to look at it now to yeah. think that that's what it used to be. And then all the showers along, along yeah. that wall and you, there. There was about ten showers. And you could walk in amongst them. That was it, yeah. <laughs> so Get them all going, yeah. Stand under this one. I'll go back over here. Sorry! Sorry! In 1973, Martin had been at Pepper Harrow for 18 months. He had a history of drunkenness, fighting, stealing, and breaking and entering. His father was an alcoholic who left home soon after Martin was born. Martin himself was already drinking heavily by the age of 12. Well, I don't really know what therapeutic means, for a start off, right? But I know, I know what this place means to me, you know? As been, you know, I know what this place means to me, you know? What's important about it to you? What well, do you reckon is, is, is important about this place? Um, well, first of all, you get the things that you need, right, you know? I mean, you get the things that you need, like, you know, the basic things of life, you know, love, caring for, and things like this, you know. The places that you just don't, things that you just don't get in any other establishment, you know. People just care for you, you know. And people are willing to, to know, you know, willing to talk to you and understand you. And, you know, people treat you like an individual, you know. And basically, I was just going to get caught up in the system. I was just going to move on to prove school, Boston, probably killed somebody, probably ended up in Broadmoor. Um, that's where I was going anyway. That was pretty definite where I was going, because I just didn't understand what was going on in my own mind. And did that system work, do you think? Of what remind homes and that? No, not to a person like me, no, no way. It would never have worked. It would have cost them millions the time they finished with me, locking me up for the next 30 years. Underneath this uh, aggressive and uh, contemptuous uh, surface, there was the most desperate depression and isolation and sense of alienation. Um, he might have been the last person left alive on the face of the earth, was actually the way that he felt. And um, I think his suffering was immense. And when he could no longer bear it, he would try and drink himself into insensibility. And he was effectively an alcoholic. And that's how it has to be. Back in 1973, Melvin Rose called a crisis meeting because Martin was outside, blind, drunk and violent, being held down by five people. And when I say the chances are he could never recover from it, I mean it. You start caring about it when it's too bloody late. The damage it's going to do to Martin is enormous. First of all, let's get this straight for those of you that aren't used to this situation. Because if you've been here a very long time, you'll know that we've met situations like this before and we've managed to cope with them. But many of you who have met situations like this before and they've wrecked your families. But the difference is that all of us can get together on this one. Out. Next morning, without a trace of a hangover, Martin tries to explain. Yeah, but there's times, you know, when you get depressed, you know, and you think everybody's against you. You think nobody likes you, and so, so you begin to hate yourself, you know. Do you reckon drink helps when you're feeling like that? Well, no, it doesn't make it any better. It just makes it worse, doesn't it, really? So why do you drink? I don't know, I suppose, because, you know, if I drink, you know, I suppose I'm hurting myself more and more, you know, because that's why I drink a hell of a lot, you know, and once I do start, you know. Yeah, you know, makes me feel like you're slobbing and pissed. So it kind of confirms your own idea? Yeah, that's right, yeah. But do you like hurting yourself? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. yeah. And that's when you get stuck into the booze? Yeah, yeah. I know what I'm doing, you know. What about the community? I mean, do you feel that you're kind of letting them down? 
Well, I used to think that, you know. I, I suppose I thought that yesterday, you know. But it does have a hell of an effect on some people, you know. Because, um, you know, you don't want a raving lunatic going around the place, do you? I mean, it frightens a lot of people. When you were a bit of a raving lunatic last night, you were roaring like a bull and knocking these five blokes about a bit on the grass outside. No, it frightens a lot of people, doesn't it? I mean, because some people have been through some experiences, you know. You know, like the old man coming in and being pissed and beating up, you know, beating them up and that. What struck us last night was the way that they were genuinely concerned about you and not just frightened of you. Everybody seemed to be very worried about you. Yeah, well, that's how it is, isn't it? It's all I did me being here, you know. Well, I suppose I... I... Well, it's the first time I'd ever been uh, able to express love to anybody. And first time I'd ever allowed anybody to express love towards me. Although, you know, it was hard work for, the, for those people, for the staff, and, and for the lads, you know. This is what it was all about, really, wasn't it? Was it rather frightening? Oh, unbelievable, terrifying. Mm. Changing the whole way of uh, behaviour, the way that you'd learned from childhood to behave. And it was, if you behaved wrongly, although you weren't punished for it, it was thrown right back in your face. And you were asked to discover why you know, acted like that. I mean, it sounds as if it was all pain, but to me it was like, you know, because enjoying myself was hard. I went on camp and that, I didn't want to go on. I did have some fantastic times, really, you know, feeling-wise towards people, you know. There was all sorts of facilities there, you know, art and mountaineering and camping and opportunities that a lot of other kids never had. We stood in good stead for later on in life, you know, and not to be so frightened to have things, really. You putting a belay on that there? <laughs> Jesus. What's above here? Nothing, I think we're going around this crate here. Tony and Brian together tackle a steep climb unsupervised. Both have a record of breaking and entering. Brian preferred shops, especially those with high back walls. Tony used to haunt his old school at night. What, what I gain from rock climbing, from climbing mountains, there, there's that, there is that connection with you know, the excitement and the danger, but there's a lot more to it. Like, I, I like to climb, climb with Brian. And, you know, it's, it's something that I can do, it's something that I've got. I remember pinching a tin of assorted biscuits from the yeah. food store and lowering them out the food store <laughs> on a rope to Brian. No, Brian was lowering them down to me. And uh, they're going past Sheffield. Yeah. Uh, one day they came out and collared us. When I left, about an hour, I left with my possessions in a rucksack and I didn't go to anywhere in particular because I felt there was a challenge to be met which was if I was ready to cope then I was going to do that and I actually just actually literally hitchhiked around the country until I found somewhere I wanted to live and that took me some four or five months and I settled on York, uh, nice town. Um, that's what I did, I just travelled the country. Um, not as a vagrant, just on a little bit of a odyssey, is that the word? Steve Johnson had understand I think. Um, but yeah, I was exploring, and I think it was important to do that, to show myself that I could handle what I was doing, um, and it worked out. I could have gone back to my original home, but that would have been the worst possible thing. I would have, I think eventually I would have gone straight back to what I was doing. I eventually um, took up training and, and qualified as a, as a nurse. Uh, because my interest was mental handicap learning disability and that was in 1980 I, I started and I've, I've been doing it ever since. Hi. Come in, Mickey, come in. Come in with me, babe.
My title is community nurse. My fundamental job is about supporting people with learning disabilities in their own community and to help people who are currently living in institutions resettle back into their own communities. You've got to hand it to you, you're pretty well getting out there and getting a job off your own back when there isn't much work around. You pleased? Yes, I am. Right. I'm pleased with the job at Lycus. You're OK? I'm OK, yeah. Part of my training is that so, I qualified as a, as a behavioural therapist and I use that training in my day-to-day -day work with some people who, who are finding life pretty difficult and who are responding to life in similar ways, which I did as a child, um, lashing out to a world which is not very, under, you know, not very understandable, I think, and, and showing people different ways of coping. Um, and, that, and that's a large part of my job. This day brings you your birth and brings you your death. Man, must you still wrap up your words in riddles? Were you not famed for your skill at solving riddles? You taunt me with a gift that is my great... But I suppose Pepper Harrow was most of those people's introduction to culture as well, I, I suppose, is what we call it. Content. I would never have dreamed of reading Greek literature. I mean, it was, it was just... Uh, I don't even know how it came about. I, I sat down and I was spoke to people and talked to people and, and started reading these books and I just grew into it. I don't know why or for what reason, I just grew into it and thoroughly enjoyed it and still read it now, in fact. He that came seeing, blind shall go, rich now, then a beggar, stick in hand, groping his way to a land of exile. I don't know, really, some people get enjoyment from their music. English, I get enjoyment from great. I don't really know what it is. I think it's, uh, it's uh, I think there's a lot of excitement in it as well, and a lot of relevance as well to sort of nowadays as well. We read Homer and Aeschylus and Euripides, things like that, and uh, eventually I got a, a gift of a book I knew, which uh, inspired me slightly to make my visits to Greece, and uh, I eventually made it to Greece as. We can see from the photo, we made it to the Acropolis on Lindos, which we uh, made it to. It was just, as I say, it was an introduction to culture for me, really, I suppose, and I eventually made my Greek expeditions and such forth. And you did some other education too? Yeah, I, I, uh, I got to the stage in the last couple of years where I was thinking about it and I went back and... Uh, I did some GCSEs, as they're called now. And uh, last year I went and did two A-levels, so... for the fun of it. <laughs> Nobody put any pressure on, on me at all to do education. I can remember times vividly of sort of li lying under a chair in one of the rooms with, one, with the person who was supposed to be teaching me, just saying, look, you know, what do you want to do then? Should we go and do this? And saying, well, I'm, gosh, I'm not doing education. I'll go and play football or I'll play table dance with you, but I'm not going to do education and um, actually feeling sort of relaxed and being able to sort of enjoy that sort of sensation. And, and when it became my choice, I then sort of felt, actually, I really need to do this. I'd, I'd learnt to spell five or six words, and I'd come back into the main building and walked into the front hall and said to some of the kids, ask me to spell something, anything you like. And one of the kids asked me to spell something, and I could spell it. And then there was another chap who was um, sort of, you know, the, sort of the intellectual of the community, and I went up to him and said, anything you like, ask me how to spell it. And he said, um, spell pneumonia. And I said, right, OK, N. And he said, no. And I said, it's got to be N, no. It's got to be N. And so it is a, a long, slow process. And because we wanted to include education as well, that had to come at the end when they were actually able to receive it. The heartwarming bit about that used to be that once they were ready, they just took off, having usually been educational failures beforehand. Well, I, I got to a point at Pabahara after about four years where I sat O-levels and then um, A-levels. My first, my first A-level, I, I sort of, I'd, I'd panicked like I'd panicked before and didn't do a thing. My second one was Greek literature, which was a subject I was very, very fond of. And um, I, I got the, the O-level within about six or seven months, um, which was, I think, sort of, you know, you know actually getting the result, Sid Elliott has got a B at Greek, Greek literature actually was the, the bit that sort of allowed me to sort of move on and do, do other things. I then did uh, an art O-level, A-level, and ended up leaving Pepper Harrow with, um, with enough qualifications to get on a degree course, which I did later on. I left Pepper Harrow and 
went home and uh, there was five under me. I was the oldest of six, so I don't know, I suppose needed by everyone at home. I had a few problems after that. I mean, I went to prison in 76, I think it was. And uh, I met my wife at the end of 76. And from there, that's been it, really. I'm currently unemployed and unskilled people, I suppose, on class days. There's not uh, that much around nowadays. I've settled down, got my family life, and that's what I always wanted, and that's what I've got. So I'm perfectly happy with it. If you get a group of adolescents who come and have a kind of second chance at uh, being parented in a therapeutic community, then if that's successful, they should be able to parent well in their turn. And then the cycle's broken. And they are raising a generation who will be perfectly capable of parenting in time. 22 years on, Martin lives back in the Lake District with his wife and three children. He trained and still works as a welder. I've been working on size of very down in Suffolk. Uh, it's been a good job. And, and what does that mean in terms of family life and all that? Well, I've heard, well I mean, I get one, one travelling weekend in four, see my kids once every four weeks for a couple of days, I leave on a Friday and go back on a Sunday. And that's the extent of what they say you. But no money, no fun, isn't it? You can't live without money. Um, I've been fortunate to be able to find work. As I said before, it's getting more and more difficult. Construction industry is about at it at the moment, anyway. Well, I mean, you could have just opted to be on the doll. Oh, no way. No way. I've very rarely been on the doll. And, uh, I, mean, I want things out of life. You know, fortunately, I had the strength to probably what I got from Pepe Arrow to. To uh, you know, to retain a skill, a skill that was badly wanted, you know, needed at one time. Not so much now because the industry the way it is. But, um, you know, well, it's been good to me. You know, it's been good to me, it's been good to my family. You know, I've got my own children. Their lives hasn't been easy. It won't be easy. Um, but there's no way in the state of mind that I was when I was their age. No way. My kids do tell me that they love me. You know, no matter how old they are. I mean, the daughter's nearly 20, the lad's 18. I mean, for a lad to tell you that he loves you is a lot. Sid has been a member of staff at Thornby Hall for the last nine years. He's married with two children. Thornby Hall opened in 1985 as part of the Pepper Harrow organization. It has built on many of the ideas developed at Pepper Harrow 20 years ago. It is run by Alan Worthington, who used to be a member of staff there. But at Thornby Hall, the intake is younger than it was at Pepper Harrow and includes girls. I originally started as a member of staff um, with a qualification to teach art, but I have taught um, Greek literature, art history, um, English, maths, all sorts of sports. I moved on from member of staff to um, team leader and a senior member of staff, and now I've just been recently promoted to assistant director. By sort of putting ideas, I mean, one you know, might look at something like this and make something of it rather than... There are situations where I've, I've had a child saying they couldn't read, and then having sort of being able to understand what that's about. I've had a child then read a page of, out of a book, which, you know, and, and watch that sort of child feel, Christ, you know, I, I can actually read this, because actually one's got past whatever the barrier is. Um, I mean, I've certainly at times had kids here saying, you don't know what it's like, and then saying, yes, you do, because some of the kids are aware of, um, you know, that I lived at Pepper Harrow, and sort of, you know, what a difference that makes. To feel a sense of that someone does understand what it's like. And actually, that, the thing about that is, at the end of the day, I mean, that's the thing that I don't sort of push you on that, is I think actually for that to mean anything for you, that has to be your choice. 
Hold on tight. Hold on tight. Yeah. People who've had a life as myself, it's very hard for them to get out of the cycle that, that they're involved in. Um, I think I can say with some confidence that I'm out of that. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's still not there. You, you don't know how many time bombs are inside a person, you never know. And I think that's something that I'm aware of each day. And I, um, through, through my family, um, make sure that that's going to be okay. My kids um, and, my, and my wife are obviously fundamentally important to me. And I don't think there's any time when I've ever felt quite as proud as when I see my kids running down the, the grass. Do you know what I mean? And um, that's a great feeling. You're going to go and see Robin at Sports Day later on? Yeah. Watch him run a race. Watch him do sports. Watch him do sports with all his friends? Yeah. I think that I can live a life where my children aren't damaged by me. I think the important thing and, and the fundamental difference is my children aren't going to be involved in the cycle of abuse that people like my, myself and many other people I, that I know and have known have been involved in. Um, Robin and Nicky are going to be okay. You weren't in the old film. Well, I was hiding. In, I was hiding. There's, there's a couple of small clips of me hiding in the background. Mm. <laughs> why is that? Well, well to, be, to be absolutely frank, the reason why I didn't want to... I told everybody that I, was, I didn't agree with the BBC coming to interrupt my life, but the, the truth of the matter was is I actually had a girlfriend in Portsmouth who I told her that I was a tailor. <laughs> 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 I didn't know that. <laughs> so I didn't want her mum and dad to see me <laughs> on the telly. <laughs> oh dear. Yeah. Your yeah. sins will find you out, that's what they say. You are sad. <laughs> that is sad. We still had failures, of course, because you can't always succeed. For some people, the process was simply too painful. For others, perhaps they came at the wrong moment. I think timing is very important. And we didn't always have control over that either. 22 years on, Time Watch managed to trace five of the six boys from the BBC film. The sixth, Pete, is known to have been released from prison in 1991, but cannot be found. Though the six Pepper Harrow boys featured by the BBC in 1973 don't constitute a scientific experiment, they were chosen at random. Only two re-offended. Funding became increasingly difficult for Pepper Harrow during the 1980s. Melvin Rose left in 1984. In 1991, there was a serious fire. And in 1993, Pepper Harrow closed. There's something slightly, um, almost sort of spooky about this, isn't there? Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. As, well, as though it never happened. Yeah, I know what you mean. And I think the majority of people were actually talented and that allowed them for their potential, their, their talent to come out. Mm. And, uh, you know, rather than draining on society the whole time, causing havoc wherever they go, you know, they've actually been able to put something back in, you know. Ian took four GCSEs before leaving Pepper Harrow and now runs a successful carpet cleaning business. Tony took his A-levels, then went on to take a degree course and now runs a centre for abused children. One looks back on an experience like that as actually a sort of a thing that's like a sort of an experience of family that, that maybe one didn't have the opportunity to have, but actually, in some ways, you know, that's been put right. And, um, and I certainly feel that, I, I, you know, in terms of sort of, you know, people I still keep in contact with, I think we all feel um, that, that Pepper Harrow will always have a very special place with, with all of us. Basically, at the end of the day, you're so unhappy with the way that you were, that you wanted to change, that you wanted to have a little bit of what other people had. You wanted to see what it was like to have what they got. And, because when you went there, you seen that the lads were happy. You know, very happy. They seemed to be happy. They had an opinion, things like that. And you wanted some of that. Ah, oh, this will do for me. <laughs> That's what I thought, anyway. This will do for me. 